Welcome, saints, to this week's Bible study, a study brought to you by your friends here at the Madariville Assembly of God. I encourage you to open your Bibles and follow along. We'll be reading from Acts chapter 5, but we'll start with some verses from Acts chapter 4 because they clearly lay the foundation for what happens in chapter 5. Uh, to lay a foundation, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ at this time is growing exponentially from 120 to 3,000 to 5,000, and the Lord Jesus is continuing to add to his church daily. Now in Acts 3, an amazing healing at the beautiful, beautiful gate of the temple had amazed the people. Uh, Peter wisely used the opportunity to preach the gospel. The Holy Ghost did his work, bringing conviction of sin, and the result was even more salvations. The religious hierarchy of Jerusalem did not like this at all. Uh, previously, they had been jealous of Jesus' popularity, and they had succeeded in having him killed. Now, much to their chagrin, there were others preaching what he had preached and working miracles in his name. And now there was not just one teaching what Jesus taught. There were many. And this is just as Jesus predicted. The, the works that I do, he said, they would do in greater works. Greater not in the sense of magnitude, but in volume. Now, all of this was especially troublesome for the Sadducees. You see, they did not believe in the afterlife or miracles. And the lame man was healed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, proving, giving very clear evidence that Jesus was still very much alive. The grave could not stop him. It could not stop his work. He was still able to perform miracles through his church. They couldn't deny the miracle. It was irrefutable. But they could try to deny the power by which it had been done. So they threatened the Christians. They told them not to preach or teach any longer in Jesus' name. Acts 4, 17. But that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Well, obviously they couldn't do that. They could not disobey the Lord, the one who had told them very clearly to go into all the world with the gospel, just as he's told us. There was no question, no need for discussion. They must obey God rather than man. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now I want to ask you, where did Peter and John go after they had been threatened? Well, where were they going when they first encountered the former lame man? You remember from Acts 3? Well, let me remind you, they were on their way to a prayer meeting. And now they go immediately to another prayer meeting, a place where the saints were gathering for prayer. Uh, they did not pray for safety. They did not pray for favor with the authorities. They prayed for boldness to preach the word of God. And they prayed for God to keep on performing miracles in Jesus' name, just as he had been doing. And that prayer for boldness was answered by a fresh infilling, a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. The place was shaken where they uh, were praying there. They were all filled once again with the Spirit, and they continued to boldly speak the word of God uh, to everyone who would hear. Then beginning with Acts 4.32, we find the church living in Koinonia, sweet fellowship with one another. The love of God was in operation just as the Lord would would have it to be. Acts 4.32 And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So it says there was a multitude of them. 
Remember the exponential growth that we talked about. And they had all things in common. Uh, communism claims that they have all things in common. It's the abolition, or you know, the abolition of private property. So some wrongly tried to convince us that what we see here is an early form of communism, but nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, private property is honored and respected in the Bible. Of course, all ownership ultimately belongs to God, but there could be no thou shalt not steal were it not for private property. And throughout history, communism has never been a godly thing. It uh, has always been an ungodly thing. In the former Soviet Union alone, it's estimated that between 12 and 20 million, million Christians were killed for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by the Soviet regime. Uh, Brother William Lasore put it very well when he said, Communism says, what is yours is mine, I'll take it. Koinonia, godly Christian fellowship that we're talking about here, says, what is mine is yours, I will share it. And then one of the most godly Christian scholars I ever met was Brother Stanley Horton. And speaking of what was going on here, he said this. The Greek here does not mean that everyone sold their property at once. Rather, from time to time, this was done as the Lord brought needs to their attention. Well, why were they doing this? What was the reasoning? Of course, it was the love of God in operation. Agape love is love that gives and sacrifices. But we also must realize that it was probably necessary logistically because of what had happened at Pentecost a short time earlier. Remember, uh, there had been thousands in town for Pentecost, and at least 3,000 of them had gotten saved that day, and apparently they did not all go home. At least some of them stayed in Jerusalem. And just the, the sheer logistics of caring for all those converts from out of town must have been daunting. They had compassion. A compassion sees a need and is moved in the Spirit and moved by love to do something about it. That's, that's the work of the Spirit in the life of a Christian. And Luke singles out one of those who was so moved upon by the Holy Ghost Moved to give a man by the name of Barnabas. His name means, it says here, the son of consolation. When you see that prefix bar uh, in a Hebrew name, it means son of something. It means Barnabas, son of consolation or son of encouragement. His sacrificial giving was an encouragement to many others in the Lord's church. Well, he had a piece of property and he was moved by the spirit, moved with compassion to sell it, and he brought the money to the apostles for distribution. He did not do it to be noticed. He did not do it to be patted on the back. He didn't do it because he was commanded to do so. But Barnabas' generous gift was noticed by the people of God. One of the couples in the church, Ananias and Sapphira, surely did take notice of what he had done, and they surely did take notice of the Response from others to his generous gift. This is where the devil used human pride, ego, and the flesh to work his evil deed. So it says in chapter 5, verse 1, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, just as Barnabas had sold a possession, and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it, we would say she was in on it. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. They had a possession. We're not even told what it was, but they sold it. They got their money. So far, there's no sin involved in this. But between the two of them, they came up with a plan. They would keep back some of the money. And still, there's no sin involved. They, they had the right to do that. But then they agreed to claim that they'd given all, and then maybe, just maybe, they would get the same kind of respect, the same kind of honors that Barnabas had received. This is where the sin comes into play, pride, ego, the flesh. And this shows just how far uh, the flesh will sink in order to be noticed, to receive glory, pats on the back. The flesh always wants to be noticed. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, wants to lift up Jesus in our lives. Now, their sin has been compared to that of Achan in the Old Testament. If you want to read about Achan, you can go to uh, the book of Joshua. Achan's sin 
uh, delayed the Israelites on their journey to the promised land. The sin of Ananias and Sapphira could have delayed the first century church in their spiritual progress to where the Lord wanted them to be. The scripture that comes to mind here is one found in the book of Numbers. Be sure your sins will find you out. Very, very true. Be sure your sin will find you out. You can hide it from people. You can hide it from others, but you can't hide it from God, and eventually it will be revealed. Acts 5.3, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? And listen to this, thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now, how on earth did Peter know what was going on in their lives? Well, he may have simply found it out through the grapevine, so to speak. But it would have been very unscriptural for him to act based on a rumor. However he knew it, there was no doubt about it. And I personally believe that he was likely used in one of the gifts of the Spirit, uh, enumerated for us in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 and 14, the word of knowledge, for example. But their sin was very serious. It was not just fleshly and carnal. It was literally satanic. Peter's words are so very strong. Why has Satan filled your heart to do this? They had acted on urges placed in their hearts by the devil himself. And there's no doubt that he was obviously trying to bring turmoil in the, in the infant church. And he's not changed. He would still like to bring turmoil, confusion, and sin into a church or into a believer. But let's remember some things about their sin. First, there was no demand that anyone give a certain amount. Scriptural giving is willing giving. It's not mandated. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, and 8, Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of necessity, because you have to, in other words. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So it's clear, no one forced them to sell the property. Also, no one forced them, once they sold it, to bring any certain part of the money to the Lord. The sin was in lying and claiming that they had done something they had not done to gain the praise of others. Now notice that it says they had lied to God and also that they'd lied to the Holy Ghost. And this is a clear scripture here, if you want one, that speaks to us of the deity of the Holy Spirit. If you're lying to the Holy Ghost, you're lying to God. Well, they wanted to be noticed, and Ananias certainly did get noticed all right, but not the kind of notice he'd expected and wanted. His notice was being publicly rebuked, a rebuke that apparently was given before the church body. And his sin was so serious that it brought about a miracle of divine justice. Verse 5. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young man arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. Now sometimes you'll hear people talk about the glorious first century church and how spiritual it was and how commonplace miracles were, and wouldn't it be wonderful to have that kind of glory, those kind of miracles that they had in the early days of Christianity? And of course that's true, but don't you forget that the sudden death of Ananias was one of those first century miracles, a miracle of judgment. Uh, sometimes miracles of divine judgment impact large groups of people. The great flood in Noah's day was a supernatural event, a miracle of God's judgment. Uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah was another miracle of God's judgment. If you remember, James and John, uh, several of the disciples were, Peter was, for example, but the Lord called James and John the sons of thunder. And on one occasion, they wanted to call down a miracle of God's judgment on the Lord's enemies. In Luke 9, 52. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So the, the Samaritans rejected Christ because he looked like he was going to Jerusalem. 
And when his disciples, James and John, these two hotheads, these sons of thunder, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them. You know not what manner of spirit you are, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. So for the most part, the Lord is certainly not in the business of striking people down, but bringing light. But drastic circumstances call for drastic actions. And we need to notice here that it was not Peter who called down the judgment on Ananias, but the Lord himself. And I think it's noteworthy that Ananias didn't even have a brief funeral. He was wrapped up very quickly without even notifying his next of kin. But sadly, this was not the last miracle of divine judgment that we see that day. Just three hours later, the second miracle of divine judgment as his wife, Sapphira faces the same consequence that he did. Remember, her husband was already buried and she didn't even know it. Acts 5, 7. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straight away at his feet and yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead. Carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Now, can you imagine this? She didn't even know that her husband was dead. In fact, he'd already been buried. He was totally unaware of the events that had just transpired. And she's very graciously given the opportunity to come clean about these things. She's given opportunity to repent. Is this really what happened? You know, she doesn't really have to meet the same fate as Ananias did. Repentance could have brought restoration, but it didn't come. Because just like her husband, she sinned against the Spirit of God, lying through her teeth, just as her late husband had done. And she faced the same terrifying judgment that her husband faced three hours earlier. She dropped dead, had a quick burial without so much as a funeral. Now you might ask, why was such drastic judgment called for in this case? I mean, we know of horrible things done by those who claim to be Jesus' followers. Why didn't they meet the same kind of judgment? A lot of this we have to leave in the hands of a much higher court than you or me. But I think of righteous, faithful Abraham in the book of Genesis he knew that God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but Abraham interceded for them, thinking that surely there must be some righteous people living there. He couldn't destroy the righteous right along with the wicked. But he also knew that the Lord would always do what was right. And I want you to hear what Abraham said about this in Genesis 18.25. It's, it's the principle that really fits the Ananias and Sapphira situation very well, too. Genesis 18.25 that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. And I know God will do what's right even if we don't understand it. He'll always do the right thing. We also know that the church could have been destroyed before it really ever began, had Satan gotten his way. He tried using persecution and failed. He tried using pride and covetousness, but... Thankful he failed. This was a baby church. Babies are so vulnerable. How horrible for a, an infant church to flounder and die because of the sin of two of its members. Well, what was the result of those two amazing miracles of judgment? Great godly fear came on all the people. Uh, this, my friend, is the fear of the Lord, which according to the Lord is the beginning of both wisdom and knowledge. And the prayers of God's saints were, were being answered. Do you remember what happened in the previous chapter? The apostles were released from custody and went right to a prayer meeting. And do you remember, saints, what they prayed? Let's read it again by way of review. Acts 4.29 And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. 
And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. So they had prayed for boldness and continued signs and wonders, and the Lord answered both of those requests. First, by sending great signs and wonders, uh, continuing to work miracles in the name of the Lord, and then also by giving them great boldness. Let's look first of all. Prayers answered through signs and wonders. Uh, these next verses in Acts 5 show that their prayer was answered. Acts 5.11, and great fear came upon all the church. Uh, that's the godly fear of the Lord. Well, the Lord also gave them a second answer to prayer. Uh, the word of God was being confirmed by miraculous signs and wonders. There was another part to their prayer. They had prayed for holy boldness, and they certainly received that as well. Acts 5.17, it says, Then the high priest arose, and all that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to all the people, all the words of this life. When they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. When the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keeper standing without before the doors. And when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the priest and the captain of the temples and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them, whereunto this would grow. <clears throat> then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. And then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. So we see here the Sadducees were the main opponents, uh, apparently, of this the main opponents of what was going on. They had been told not to preach or teach in Jesus' name anymore. But it was this preaching in Jesus' name that goes against their traditions, their so-called theology. Uh, they believed that they had silenced Jesus, that he was dead. Now here are a bunch of people claiming he's alive and demonstrating that he's alive by signs and wonders and miracles. Remember, Jesus is still doing things in and through his church. Ananias and Sapphira's sin was instigated by the devil, but prompted by their flesh, by their jealousy. And the persecution that came at that time was the, was the same. The high priest and a group of other Sadducees arrested the apostles, apparently all of them, out of jealousy and, and the flesh. But prison bars can't stop the work of the Lord. In, in the middle of the night, the angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison, brought them out. I wonder if others escaped that night. We're not told. But remember, angels are something else the Sadducees didn't even believe in. This whole thing is just a blow against their theology in a number of ways. Well, what did the angel of the Lord tell them to go? Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. In other words, don't cower. Don't be afraid. Stand and speak. Uh, don't stand and speak in some isolated, safe corner some safe zone, stand and speak in the temple, right where the enemies of the cross can see you and hear you. And they didn't waste any time. By early morning, they were already standing and preaching. And when the officials heard this, they couldn't figure out what was happening. They sent to have them removed from prison, only to realize they had already been released by the hand of the Lord. And the theology, like I said, of the Sadducees is still being challenged by the miraculous power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were very fearful. Now, how big is this thing going to get? We, we've got to put a stop to this now. They didn't arrest them then and there, though, because just as they'd been with Jesus, they were afraid of the crowds, afraid of the people. Uh, the people were excited about what God was doing, and they would have stoned the religious officials had they tried to stop it. Well, the apostles were again arrested. And how many times does this make here in, in these few chapters? They were still operating in the power of the Holy Ghost and the holy boldness that they prayed for had been received. Verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them, 
saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. That's a principle that we need to remember. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So they brought them before the council, the same Sanhedrin that had ordered the crucifixion of Jesus. Some of the men, I would say, undoubtedly were in that number. Didn't you hear us the first time? They said, you were told not to do this, and here you are doing it. You've disobeyed us, and all of Jerusalem has been literally filled with this doctrine, this teaching that you're giving. And you intend to blame us for the death of this man. And, of course, this man is the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't ever utter his name. But they bore responsibility for his death. Peter boldly makes that clear. And we ought to obey God rather than man is, is the principle here. It's a principle we still hold. We are to obey the laws of human government so long as those laws don't contradict a higher law of God. And they were so bold. Peter, remember, he's the one who denied the Lord. Now he's before the same group that killed his Savior, Jesus, pointing a finger at them and saying, You killed him. You nailed him to the cross. We know, of course, the grave couldn't hold him. He's now exalted to the Father's right hand, a prince, a Savior. Once again, the theology of the Sadducees is threatened. Jesus is alive. Jesus is still moving, even though we had him crucified. And they said, We're witnesses of these things. We're telling you, what we've seen, what we've heard. We must obey God. The Holy Ghost also is a witness. The Holy Ghost was undoubtedly bringing conviction upon those who heard. Conviction will either bring brokenness and repentance if yielded to, but if it's resisted, it will bring anger, and that's what happened here. They resisted the very conviction of God. They rejected the gospel. They became very angry. You know, verse 33 says they were cut to the heart, and they took counsel to, to slay them. I can just imagine, we found a way to get the job done with that man, that Jesus. Now we need to find a way to get rid of these pesky followers of his. Then there were the wise words of a teacher by the name of Gamaliel. Verse 34. Then stood up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law had in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space and said unto them, You men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Theudas, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I send you, refrain from these men and let them alone, for if this counsel or work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. Now, Gamaliel was a member of their group, but unlike many of them, he was a Pharisee, not a Sadducee. He didn't agree with the Sadducees theologically. He was one of the most highly respected rabbis of that day. He had, had one student that you've heard of. He was the esteemed rabbi who taught the Apostle Paul. So Gamaliel reminds them this is not the first time that some person's raised up a following, caused trouble. He reminds them of someone named Theudas. Uh, Josephus, the historian, possibly mentions this Theudas. It has his date somewhat mixed up. Also, he mentions this other that drew a following, Judas of Galilee. And, of course, note that this is not to be confused with Jesus' former apostle, Judas. Gamaliel said these two fizzled out on their own. Let this one alone for now, and it will likely meet the same fate if it's not of God. But if it is of God, we dare not lift our hand against it. Now, are his wise words always true? Well, 
not always in this life. We know that many false religions out there do seem to thrive and grow by leaps and bounds. However, that does not mean they're of God. But they will meet him one day and justice will be served. Well, we want to say thank you, Gamaliel. Uh, you've not been a follower of the Lord, perhaps, but you were used by God to protect his servants. Well, what was the response to these wise words? Verse 40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So this time it was more than catch and release, uh, more than just a slap on the hand, a command not to preach or teach. This time they beat them. They gave them the 39 stripes. Just don't let us hear you preaching or teaching in Jesus' name. But still, they were walking in such boldness, church. They, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame. Their rejoicing is one of the most convicting and, and powerful statements in the Word of God. There's no talk about poor me or what, do, what did I do to deserve this. There's no going into what I would call a hunker-down mode. They were still bold about their witness. They continued going to the temple to preach and teach every single day, as well as in houses and wherever else the opportunity arose knowing that it could cost them, but knowing they must boldly obey the Lord. And that kind of boldness can only come through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, those of us here in America have had a relatively easy time serving the Lord compared with our brothers and sisters around the world. Now, many of them have suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. Yet we don't know what the future holds for us. We know that the present world system is already operating under the spirit of Antichrist, and there's certainly a great need for holy boldness on our part. So in closing, let's pray as those early Christians did in Acts 4. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant unto your servants, Lord, that with all boldness we may speak your word. Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders would be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would fill us anew and afresh with the Holy Spirit, that we would speak the word of God with boldness. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Lord willing, we'll be back here next week with Acts chapter 6. I hope that you can be with us. Until we meet again, may the Lord hold you in the hall of his hand. Maranatha. If you would like to contact us, we meet at the corner of Boston and Madison Streets in Maryville. Uh, we are here 10 a.m. for Sunday school, 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. for Sunday worship. Uh, these Bible studies, you can be a part of one of these live and in person uh, here on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. And all of these times are Eastern. If you'd like to reach us by mail, we can be reached at Maderyville Assembly of God, Post Office Box 160, Maderyville, Indiana, 47957. By phone at 219-843-2262 or by email at AG at yahoo.com.